morning, family. It's always a pleasure to be with you. I hope this message finds you well. And I pray that you've been inspired by our worship service so far. Uh, I hope the testimonies have helped draw you closer to the Lord. This week has been a bittersweet week for our church family as uh, we celebrated the baptism of Rochi into our campus ministry last Saturday, but then mourned on Sunday due to the untimely passing of uh, Harriet Tumwesije, the mother of our brother Mark in Kampala, Uganda, most likely due to COVID uh, complications. And so sadly, she was only 48 years old. Please continue to pray for God just to comfort and support Mark's family through this tragedy, as well for all of those who have experienced just the loss of loved ones recently due to COVID or other illnesses, like our dear sister, Jeanette Grumbo. Today uh, marks the conclusion of our Exodus series, and it's been a privilege for me to just unlock the gospel of the Old Testament with you, and I hope it's been inspiring uh, for you to learn that the heart of God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Like the Israelites escaping their slavery in Egypt, the book of Exodus really serves to define our identity as a redeemed people brought into a covenant relationship with the Lord, a, a people whom God chooses to dwell. Over the last three months, we've seen the character of God revealed through studying the topics in the book of Exodus, such as uh, the Lord raises up a deliverer, Exodus 1 and 2. The Lord reveals himself to man, chapters 3 and 4. The Lord declares war, chapter 5 through 11. The Lord redeems his people. At Passover, chapter 12, the Lord's way leads to rejoicing, chapters 13 and 14. The Lord provides life lessons in the desert, chapters 15 to 17. The Lord Almighty is with us, chapter 18. The Lord calls to his people from the mountain. Chapter 19, the Lord gives the Ten Commandments. Chapter 20, the Lord dwells with his people. Chapter 24, and the Lord disciplines his people for great sin. Chapters 32 and part of 33. Today's final message is simply, the Lord reveals the glory of his presence. Let's turn to Exodus chapter 33. Exodus chapter 33. Last week we saw the people of Israel in a troubled state as God had to discipline them for the great sins of impatience and people pleasing, which led to idolatry and even an orgy at the bottom of Mount Sinai. When the Lord informed Moses of this, he pleaded for the sake of the Israelites to the Lord, and the Lord relented from completely annihilating them. Moses then goes down the mountain after receiving the instructions for the tabernacle and the Ten Commandments to see the truth with his own eyes. The Israelites were just engaging in immorality and idolatry at the base of the mountain. Moses sees their worship of the golden calf, and in his indignation, he shatters the Ten Commandments on the ground, signifying the broken covenant of the people with God. He then proceeds to burn and grind the wooden calf, which was overlaid with gold, into powder, scatters it in the water, and makes the people drink it. Hey, no joke. The calf is ultimately reduced to human waste. Moses and the, those loyal to the Lord destroy all those who are idolatrous. And it seems that Israel's glorious escape from Egypt into the wilderness has come to an abrupt end. But, and the truth is, God had every right to start over. But thankfully, that's not what happens next. In Exodus 32, verse 31, God, really Moses uh, exemplifies righteous leadership as he stands the gap for a second time before the people and the Lord by going back up the mountain and humbly pleading with God to forgive their great sins and even offering to take their place. God reminds Moses of his justice and calls him to lead the people with, while also sending a plague to discipline them for their sins. Well, let's pick it up here in Exodus chapter 33, starting in verse 1 to 6. The Bible reads here. 
Then the Lord said to Moses, leave this place, you and the people you brought up out of Egypt, and go up to the land I promised on oath to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, saying, I will give it to your descendants. I will send an angel before you and drive out the Canaanites, Amorites, Hittites, per Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. Go up to the land flowing with milk and honey, but I will not go with you because you are a stiff-necked people and I might destroy you on the way. When the people heard these distressing words, they began to mourn and no one put on any ornaments. For the Lord had said to Moses, tell the Israelites, you are a stiff-necked people. If I were to go with you even for a moment, I might destroy you. Now take up your ornaments and I'll decide what to do with you. So the Israelites stripped off their ornaments at Mount Horeb. Wow, okay, first point today, very straightforward. God's presence is a privilege, not an entitlement. God's presence is a privilege, not an entitlement. Well, what do we see here? God says he will no longer be with his people. Their rebellious hearts and stiff-necked nature has separated them from God. And in his mercy, he does not want to destroy them. The people are distressed by this truth and more. So why is this important to us? Well, because our unrepentant sin also separates us from God. If not for Jesus' death on the cross as an atonement for our sins, we would not even have an opportunity to receive the mercy of God. We see that in Isaiah 59, verse 1 and 2. For our guest this morning, do you take the opportunity to get reconciled with God for granted? For those of you who are disciples of Jesus, do you feel entitled to forgiveness when you sin? Or do you feel privileged that you have the opportunity to repent? It is a privilege, family, to get open about our sins, repent as a baptized disciple so his blood can wash us clean. Let's take a look at a proper response in 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians in chapter 7. 2 Corinthians chapter 7. Let's pick it up here in verse 8. The Apostle Paul is talking about the heart of true repentance to the church here in Corinth. The Bible reads, 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 8. Even if I cause you sorrow by my letter, I do not regret it. Though I did regret it, I see that my letter hurts you, but only for a little while. Yet now I'm happy, not because you were made sorry, but because your sorrow led you to repentance. For you became sorrowful as God intended, and so were not harmed in any way by us. Godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret. But worldly sorrow brings death. See what this godly sorrow has produced in you. What earnestness, what eagerness to clear yourselves, what indignation, what alarm, what longing, what concern, what readiness to see justice done. At every point, you have proved yourselves to be innocent in this matter. Amen. You know, the Greek word for repentance is metanoia, from which we get the word metamorphosis. And so it means to change the form or nature of something or someone into something completely different. For example, the change of uh, a caterpillar into a butterfly. Repentance is not just about being sorry, right? Many people say they're sorry, but they're only sorry because they got caught. God doesn't want emotional words that relieve us of guilt, right? God desires regret and remorse, a godly sorrow that leads to repentance. You know, when you repent, you're going one way. You stop, you turn around, you start going the other way. You stop doing what's wrong and you start doing what's right. Are you with me here? And so how do you know when someone truly has a repentant heart? Well, they're, according to scriptures, they're eager to clear themselves. They're indignant. They have a righteous anger, right? They're alarmed about allowing themselves to fall into sin or to be tempted to sin. Because, you know, you don't really fall into sin. You, you, you decide to sin, right? It's not like a hole you fall into. You make the conscious decision. Um, but anyone who really wants to repent, really, they, they long to prove themselves as a person of integrity, 
and they're focused on making sure that it won't happen again, that sin won't happen again in the future. They're ready to acknowledge their sin humbly and be taught and accept the necessary discipline. If someone doesn't have that kind of godly sorrow, then they do not appreciate the mercy of God. Turn me over to Psalms 51. Psalms chapter 51. You know, King David um, is an, was an example of a person who had this type of contrite heart, remorseful heart. Um, after the horrific sins of adultery, murder, deceit in his affair with Bathsheba, he was broken about his sinfulness and cried out to God in Psalms 51. Let's read together here, in, starting in verse 1. The Bible reads, Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion. Blot out my transgressions, wash away all my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions, and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you are proved right when you speak and justified when you judge. See, he's acknowledging his sin here. He's not making excuses for it. He's making it very clear. Let's keep reading down in verse 10. The Bible reads, Create in me a pure heart, O God and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Amen. You see, David acknowledged that he had done evil things and deserved punishment. He pleaded with the Lord just to help him have a pure heart and a steadfast spirit. He realized that God could cast him from his presence, take away his Holy Spirit from him, and he knew, that he knew he needed a willing heart to stay faithful. Well, for you this morning, where is your heart? Do you think you're entitled to the presence of God if you live an unholy life? Do you have a godly sorrow like David does right here? You see, having this false pretense, this religiosity, it doesn't please God and it doesn't fool God. False religion is worthless. Consider the warning from the prophet Jeremiah in Jeremiah chapter 7. Let's take a look there. Jeremiah chapter 7. Let's pick it up here, starting in verse 1. The Bible reads, This is the word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord. Stand at the gate of the Lord's house and there proclaim this message. Hear the word of the Lord, all you people of Judah who come through these gates to worship the Lord. This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel says, reform your ways and your actions, and I will let you live in this place. You see, it's a privilege, not an entitlement. Verse four, do not trust in deceptive words and say, oh, this is the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the, the temple of the Lord. If you really change your ways and your actions and deal with each other justly, if you do not oppress the alien, the fatherless, or the widow, and do not shed innocent blood in this place, and if you do not follow other gods to your own harm, then I will let you live in this place, in the land I gave your forefathers forever and ever. But look, you're trusting in deceptive words that are worthless. Will you steal and murder, commit adultery and perjury, burn incense to Baal, and follow other gods you have not known? And then come stand before me in this house, which bears my name, and say, we are safe. Safe to do all these detestable things. Has this house, which bears my name, become a den of robbers to you? But I have been watching, declares the Lord. Don't mess with the Lord. You see, the Israelites thought that they were entitled to God's presence, being with them when they went to the temple, right? The Jews thought this, but they were very mistaken. In the same way Christians today can have the same entitlement to believe that they're holy simply by stepping into a church building. Family, we are called to be holy through repentance. Turn over to Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7. Other types of religious people are deceived when they supposedly witness Miraculous signs that they believe are from God. Sadly, those who are ignorant of the truth 
of repentance and baptism are going to be very surprised when they stand before the Lord. Let's pick it up here. See what Jesus has to say about this. Matthew chapter 7, picking it up in verse 21 to 23. The Bible reads, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did, did we not prophesy in your name? And in your name, drive out demons and perform many miracles. Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. Jesus didn't play around. He spoke the truth. You see, prophesying, driving out demons, miracles, were miraculous gifts of the Holy Spirit from the time of the first century apostles that concluded with the canonization of the Bible in around 150 AD or so. And so scriptures like 1 Corinthians 13, 8 to 10, Hebrews 1, 1 to 3, 2 Thessalonians 2, 9 to 12, make this fact very clear. However, many people are still led astray by false prophets like Benny Hill, talking about being slain in the spirit, hitting people with his coat. It's like, what? I mean, intelligent people are falling for this nonsense. People still are led astray because they refuse to believe the truth of God's word. And instead, they focus more on their experience. Maybe some of you, you don't believe that this is fuel. So, I'm turning it into a pineapple juice. I'm turning it into pineapple juice. The word is upon it. Oh. You want to drink pineapple juice? <laughs> okay. But the devil tried to attack your child. Do you have children? Yes, man of God. How many? Two. 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 Yes. Should I use it? Should I use it? Oh, deeper man of Should God. Should I use? Should I capture the picture? Professor, I'm Oh, deeper man of God. Take a look at 2 Thessalonians 2. You'll see for yourself. 2 Thessalonians. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Let's pick it up here in verse 9. The Bible states here, The coming of the lawless one will be in accordance with the work of Satan, displayed in all kinds of counterfeit miracles, signs, and wonders, and in every sort of evil that deceives those who are perishing. They perish because they refuse to love the truth and so be saved. For this reason, God sends them a powerful delusion so they will believe the lie and so that all will be condemned who have not believed the truth but have delighted in wickedness. You see, family, instead of holding to the word of God, religious people can think that they're in the presence of God when they're being deceived by counterfeit miracles, wonders, and signs. And Jesus made it very clear from Matthew 7, our salvation is based on doing the will of God, not miraculous signs. When we sin, we have the privilege, we have the opportunity to repent. And that is a gift of the Almighty God. Now, there may be consequences for our sin, but the Lord is able to restore us and remain among us. Are you with me here? How seriously are you taking repentance? Is it a privilege to you? Or do you think you're entitled to God's forgiveness? Let's get back to Exodus. 
Exodus chapter 33. Let's pick it up here in verse 12. Exodus 33, picking it up in verse 12. The Bible reads, Moses said to the Lord, you have been telling me, lead these people, but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. You have said, I know you by name and you have found favor with me. If you are pleased with me, teach me your ways so I may know you and continue to find favor with you. Remember that this nation is your people. The Lord replied, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. Then Moses said to him, if your presence does not go with us, do not send us up from here. How will anyone know that you are pleased with me and with your people unless you go with us? What else will distinguish me and your people from all the other people on the face of the earth? And the Lord said to Moses, I will do the very thing you have asked because I am pleased with you and I know you by name. Awesome. Point number two today. The presence of the Lord is established by our knowledge and obedience to God's word. Amen. The presence of God is established by our knowledge and obedience to his word. You see, after the presence of the Lord departed from the people, Moses actually took a tent and he took it away from the camp and had a quote unquote tent of meeting to inquire of the Lord. Moses was struggling. He was struggling with the challenges of leading people whose sins of rebellion and unbelief would stop them from making it to the promised land. So what does he do? In verse 13 here, we see the answer. He asked God. He asked God to teach him his ways so he could know the Lord and find favor with him. And as a result, God chooses to return his presence to him. That's what distinguishes God's people from even the religious world. It's our knowledge and obedience of God's ways. Our love for God and his people are the great commandments that enable us to be righteous as we repent of our sins daily and teach God's word to others. Turn over to Psalms 89. Psalms chapter 89. Let's pick it up here in verse 14. I'm going to read 14 to 18. It says here, Righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. Love and faithfulness go before you. Blessed are those who have learned to acclaim you, who walk in the light of your presence, O Lord. They rejoice in your name all day long. They exult in your righteousness. For you are their glory and strength, and by your favor you exalt our horn. Indeed, our shield belongs to the Lord, our King, to the Holy One of Israel. Amen. See, if you're a guest this morning, I want to encourage you. Seek to learn and obey God's word so you can walk in the light of his presence. Obedience shows our integrity. You know, Psalms 41 verse 12 states, Quote, because of my integrity, you uphold me and set me in your presence forever. Amen. Psalms 41 verse 12. Because of my integrity, you uphold me and set me in your presence forever. Spiritual integrity is the purity of heart and mind in obedience to God, even when there's no one around, even when no one can see you. If someone were to watch you when you're at home, could they tell that you're a Christian? Could they, would they know that you read and apply the word of God to your life? Or do you just play a Christian on Sunday? Family, we've got to have deep conviction. That's what integrity is all about. It's the soundness of character. Not just what's on the outside, what's on the inside. See, many people are under the mistaken assumption that listening to God's word on Sunday morning is enough. They don't think you actually have to apply it or even believe it. <laughs> if you're our guest this morning, do, do you apply the sermons you hear? I mean, do you apply it and put God's word into practice? Or do you think that by simply listening to me, you now are going to enter in the presence of God? Do not be misled. Do not be deceived. Whatever you've been taught before, you have to know the word of God and obey it. Take a look over in James chapter 1. 
James chapter 1. <clears throat> James chapter 1, let's pick it up here in verse 22. The Bible reads, Do not merely listen to the word, and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like a man who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself, goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But the man who looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues to do this, not forgetting what he has heard, but doing it, he will be blessed in what he does. Amen. You see, family, God's word is it's like a mirror. It shows you exactly where you are. But the question is, after you look in a mirror and you see stuff in your eye or something in your teeth, you just look in the mirror and then walk away and do nothing about it? If you're listening to a, this message and you decide not to repent, not to apply the word of God to your life, that's what you're doing. You're walking around with sleep in your eye. You're walking around with broccoli in your teeth. And the sad thing is, is that when people try to point it out to you, you're like, ah, well, who are you to say that? Okay, so you don't want me to tell you you have sleep in your eye and a broccoli in your teeth. Is that it? <laughs> See how ridiculous and stupid that is? We have to be teachable. We, we got to be willing to learn and obey God's word question for you is, do you actually want to look into a mirror and see what you look like spiritually? Not just on the outside. Anybody could put up, put on some nice clothes. I'm talking about your character, your integrity. Who are you really? You see, family, it's by, it's by obeying the word of God that we get to have freedom. We're, we're set free from that spiritual slavery to sin, the lust, the greed, the deceit, the insecurity, the pride, Right? And now we can be blessed by God. Many people are deceived because they think that by merely listening to God's word, they're now distinguished from the pagan world. Family, the Pharisees, back in the times of Jesus, the religious Pharisees, right? Teachers of the law. They knew the commands of God, but they didn't obey it. They were still slaves to their sin. Take a look with me over in Matthew 23. Let's see what Jesus has to say about this. Matthew 23, we'll pick it up here in verse 25. The Bible says here, Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites! You clean the outside of the cup and dish, but inside they are full of greed and self-indulgence. Blind Pharisee, first clean the inside of the cup and dish, and then the outside also will be clean. <laughs> Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites! You are like whitewashed tombs, which look beautiful on the outside, but on the inside are full of dead men's bones and everything unclean. In the same way, on the outside you appear to people as righteous, but on the inside you are full of hypocrisy and wickedness. <sighs> Whoa. See, Jesus didn't mince words. He spoke the truth in love, but he spoke the truth. Question for us today is, are you righteous? Are you righteous in outward appearance or sincerely from the depths of your heart? Because if you really get this, you're going to change and you're going to help to change others because you'll see the bold front that they're putting up that needs to be taken down so they too can become sincere, righteous people of God. You know, King David Take a look over everything back to Psalm 51. King David, a man after God's own heart, understood this when he decided to repent to be broken before the Lord. Let's say, take a look in Psalm 51 again. And let's read verses 12 to 17. The Bible says here, Psalm 51, verse 12, Restore to me the joy of your salvation. Grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Then I will teach transgressors your ways. And sinners will turn back to you. Sla save me from blood guilt. Save me from blood guilt. Because he knew what he had done. Oh God, the God who saves me and my tongue will sing of your righteousness. Oh Lord, open my lips and my mouth will declare your praise. You do not delight in sacrifice or I would bring it. You do not take pleasure in burnt offerings. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit. A broken and contrite heart. Oh God, you will not despise. Wow. You see, if you're grateful for your salvation, 
then you'll tell others. You'll help others. You'll teach others. Who are you teaching? You know, I'm so proud of our members in the church as they're studying to become teachers of God's word through our First Principles course. This church is, is really dedicated to preparing every disciple of Jesus to preach the word in a corrupt generation so they can truly shine like stars and not be led astray by false doctrine. You can't master something without teaching it. And Jesus commanded all of his disciples to make disciples in the Great Commission, Matthew 28. Come on, let's take a look. Let's take a look. Let's remind ourselves of the Great Commission. Because sadly, in the religious world today, the Great Commission has become the Great Omission. People aren't doing this, but yet they call themselves Christians. Matthew 28, let's see what the Bible says here in verse 18. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. That's probably the most important encouraging part of this passage, that Jesus' presence will be with us as we go about his business, his work, his mission, his dream to see this lost world saved. If you claim to be a Christian this morning, a disciple of Jesus, are you actively trying to make other disciples of Jesus? Baptizing them for the forgiveness of sins, Acts chapter 2, verse 38, and teaching them to obey everything that Jesus commanded? You see, this is not the great suggestion, right? For people who claim to be religious. Oh, I don't have the gift of evangelism. No, no, no. Evangelism is friendships. We're just building friendships so we can help other people get to know God. If you're our guest today, do you know, do you even know what it means to be a disciple of Jesus? Has anyone taught you how? Please reach out to us. Let's get united on the word of God so we can understand his grace and mercy in our lives. It's time to honor God through our unity so that the world will see the true nature of God. Well, let's get back to Exodus. Exodus 33. Let's pick it up here in verse 18. Then Moses said, now show me your glory. And the Lord said, I will cause all my goodness to pass in front of you, and I will proclaim my name, the Lord, in your presence. I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I'll have compassion on whom I will have compassion. But he said, you cannot see my face, for no one may see me and live. Then the Lord said, there is a place near me where you may stand on a rock when my glory passes by. I will put you in the, the cleft in the rock and cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I'll remove my hand and you will see my back, but my face must not be seen. Whew, that is intense, right? Let's keep reading. Then the Lord said to Moses, chisel out two stone tablets like the first ones, and I'll write on them the words that were on the first tablets, which you broke. Be ready in the morning and then come up on Mount Sinai. Present yourself to me there on top of the mountain. No one is to come with you or be seen anywhere in the mountain. Not even the flocks and herds may graze in the front of the mountain. So Moses chiseled out two stone tablets like the first ones and went up to Mount Sinai early in the morning as the Lord had commanded him. And he carried the two stone tablets in his hands. Then the Lord came down in the cloud and stood there with him and proclaimed his name, the Lord. And he passed in front of Moses proclaiming, the Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion and sin. Yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children and their children for the sins of the fathers to the third and fourth generation. Remember they talked about that generational sin stuff. Moses bowed to the ground at once and worshipped. Oh, Lord, if I have found favor in your eyes, he said, then let the Lord go with us. You see, he still wants God's presence with him. How much do you want God's presence with you? 
And so awesome. That as a baptized disciple, God's presence is with us. The Lord is with us. His Spirit, His Holy Spirit is within us. Do you take that for granted? And how you think and how you act. Although this is a stiff-necked people, forgive our wickedness and our sin and take us as your inheritance. Then the Lord said, I am making a covenant with you. Before all your people, I will do wonders never before done in any nation in all the world. The people who live among will see how awesome is the work that I, the Lord, will do for you. Amen. We've seen God do incredible miracles, even this year right here in Johannesburg. Well, our last point today is very simple. The glory of God is shown through his character and our own. The glory of God is shown through his character and our own. You see, when the Lord allows Moses to see his goodness pass in front of him, he proclaims his character here in Exodus chapter 34, verse 6. Our God is compassionate. He's gracious. He's slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, forgiving wickedness. That is who our God is. Do we express the, the glory of God in our character by expressing his nature in our lives? If God is like this towards people who deserve to be destroyed, then how much more should we, as recipients of his grace, extend the same forgiveness and love to others? Take a look over on John 17. John chapter 17. You know, the desire of every Christian should be to express the glory of God, the character of God to the world. This is what Jesus prayed for as he prepared to go to the cross. He displayed the glory of God by displaying the character of the Father in his life. Let's take a look here in John 17. We'll read verse 1 to 5. The Bible reads, After, this, after Jesus said this, he looked toward heaven and prayed, Father, the time has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son may glorify you. For you granted him authority over all people that he might give eternal life to all those you have given him. Now this is eternal life, that they may know you, the one, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I have brought you glory on earth by completing the work you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. Wow. You see, Jesus brought glory to the Father by completing the work the Father had given him to do, living a sinless life and dying for those who were undeserving on the cross. So how do we, how, how do we bring glory to God through our character on earth? Well, the Bible actually states some important ways which where, where we can glorify the Lord. I'll give you a couple. Um, one, we glorify God by praising him and making him known. Take a look over in Psalms 105. Psalms 105. Let's see what the Bible says here. Psalms 105, the Bible reads in verse 1 to 4, Give thanks to the Lord. Call on his name. Make known among the nations what he has done. Sing to him. Sing praise to him. Tell of all his wonderful acts. Glory in his holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Look to the Lord in his strength. Seek his face always. That's how we glorify the Lord. We glorify God by praising him and making him known. Another way we glorify the Lord. Take a look over in Matthew 5. Matthew chapter 5. Another way we can glorify the Lord is by good deeds in our life, by being excellent in our character, living godly, holy lives. Matthew chapter 5, the Bible reads here in verse 14. Matthew 5 verse 14, it says, You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. 
Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before men that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. You know, I've heard it said, our lives may be the only Bible that some people ever read. They may never read the Bible. They may never read the scriptures. But when they see your life, they can say, wow, that's what it means to be a righteous man, to be a righteous woman. That's what it means to be an authentic Christian, a true disciple of Jesus Christ. By our deeds, by our life, that's how we glorify God. Uh, another way we glorify God. Take a look over in John 15. We glorify God by bearing fruit, amen? Bearing fruit through discipleship and making uh, other disciples. And we also bear fruit through the fruits of the Spirit. John 15, let's pick it up here. The Bible says here, picking it up in verse 8. John 15, verse 8, it says, This is to my Father's glory, that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. So remain in my love. If you obey my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have obeyed my Father's commands, and remain in his love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love is known than this, that he laid out his life for his friends. That's what it's all about. We're, we're, we're laying down our lives so that more people can get a chance to know God. Are you with me here, family? That's what this is all about. That's what Jesus did for us. Verse 14, you are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I've called you friends for everything I've learned from my father. I've made known to you. That's the heart we need to have. Everything we've learned, we're trying to make known to others. Verse 16, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you to go and bear fruit. Fruit. That will last. See, we don't just make disciples, baptize them. We teach them to obey everything. You with me here? The process doesn't stop once you say Jesus is Lord and get baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. No, no, no. That's when it starts. That's when it begins. <laughs> then the Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. This is my command. Love each other. We glorify God by bearing fruits of discipleship and making um, disciples, and also, of course, the fruit of the Spirit, Galatians chapter 5. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, self-control, bearing that in our lives so people can see it. A couple others for you. We glorify God by spiritual unity. This is a big one, Romans 15. We glorify God through our spiritual unity. You know, evangelizing the world we could do that through a couple internet articles that talk about us and call people to repent and be baptized and become true disciples, right? But keeping the unity, woo, that's not easy, right? That's work. Romans 15, the Bible says here in verse 5, Romans 15, verse 5 to 7, it says, May the God who gives endurance and encouragement give you a spirit of unity among yourselves as you follow Christ Jesus, so that with one heart and mouth you may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Wow. Accept one another then, just as Christ accepted you, in order to bring praise to God. Isn't it amazing that? When we work to build spiritual unity, even though it may be challenging sometimes, right? We gotta, gotta continue to endure that we actually glorify God through those actions, through that heart to be united. Are you glorifying God today? Or are you harboring secret sins, right? Do you have quiet reservations towards people? That's not okay. That's ungodly. We gotta beg God for the heart to glorify him through our unity with other disciples. I'll give you one more. We glorify God by being holy and pure. Take a look over in 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Let's pick it up here in verse 18. The Bible says here, 1 Corinthians 6 verse 18. 
Flee from sexual immorality. All other sins a man commits are outside his body. But he who sins sexually sins against his own body. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your body. We glorify God through our bodies by being holy and pure. You see, family, when our character is shown through these actions, we bring glory to God. What, what a privilege it is. What a, what a privilege it is to, to help the world, to, to see the glory of God through our character. Are you bringing God glory today through your character? Or are you just adding to the hypocrisy that just embitters the world and closes their hearts to the gospel and grieves the Holy Spirit? Remember the character of God. Remember his heart and be inspired by his example. Let's take a look over in Psalms 103. Psalms 103. Remember the character of God. Remember who you claim to follow. Psalms 103 says here in verse 7, He has made known his ways to Moses, his deeds to the people of Israel. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. He will not always accuse, nor will he harbor his anger forever. He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. How are we grateful for that family? If you are a true baptized disciple. As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. For he knows how we are formed. He remembers that we are dust. As for man, his days are like grass. He flourishes like a flower of the field. The wind blows over it and it is gone. And its place remembers it no more. Life is so fragile, family. What are we doing with the time that God has given us? Verse 17. But from everlasting to everlasting, the Lord's love is with those who fear him and his righteousness with their children's children, with those who keep his covenant and remember to obey his precepts. Amen. Are you obeying the word of God out of gratitude for his compassion? and for God's grace. You see, if we're really grateful for the love and mercy of God, then it's gonna have an effect in our lives. God does not treat us as our sins deserve. As a result, we should live lives of just abundant gratitude, not entitlement, right, for the mercy of God. The greatest danger, the greatest danger we face in this life is not COVID-19. It's not poverty, nope. The greatest danger we face is indifference to the grace and mercy of God. Take a look over in Hebrews 10. It's not just about this life, family. It's about your soul. It's about eternity. Hebrews chapter 10. The Bible says here in verse 26, Hebrews 10, verse 26, if we deliberately keep on sinning after we've received the knowledge of the truth, no sacrifice for sins, is left, but only a fearful expectation of judgment and of raging fire that will consume the enemies of God. You see, when we, when we decide to not repent and we can just continue sinning, taking advantage of God's grace, you're making yourself an enemy of God. Verse 28, anyone who rejected the law of Moses died without mercy. That's the old covenant. That's the old relationship, right? On the testimony of two or three witnesses, how much more severely <clears throat> do you think a person deserves to be punished who has trampled the Son of God underfoot, who has treated as an unholy thing the blood of the covenant that sanctified him and who has insulted the Spirit of grace? <sighs> For we know him who said, it is mine to avenge, I will repay, and again, the Lord will judge his people. It is a dreadful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Family, have, if you're a friend joining us today, have you been insulting 
the spirit of grace by unrepented sin in your life. God will not be mocked. He will not be fooled. I mean, he knows the thoughts and the attitudes of your heart, not just what you portray to other people. And so a lot of people say, you know, how could a loving God send people to hell? And I always respond to them, well, how could a just God, a God of justice, right and wrong, weighing you on the scales, right? How could a just God send people to heaven? You don't deserve it. That's the truth. See, if God were to keep a record of our sins, no one could stand if not for the sacrifice and atonement of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. May we always be grateful, family. Otherwise, we are but great fools. Well, the rest of the chapters of Exodus displays the, the gratitude of the Israelites for receiving the mercy of God. They, they got themselves in check and got themselves together. Moses comes down comes back down the mountain with the Ten Commandments of God and stone tablets, and he speaks to the people all that the Lord has commanded them to do, and they do it. The whole retelling of the tabernacle is told from the vantage point of obedience and glad obedience. In Exodus chapters 35 to 40, the scriptures state about a hundred times to say that people did what God said. They made what he asked them to make. They obeyed, right? Eighteen times. In five chapters, it says, and they did just as the Lord had commanded through Moses. Exodus 25 to 31 tells the, the narrative of the tabernacle from the inside and out, beginning with the ark and moving out. Exodus chapter 35 to 40 tells the story of the construction from the outside in. And doing what God has told us to do is really the conviction of a people who were grateful, right? For the grace of God, and therefore they obeyed his word. They finally got it for that for the time being. And then when the work of the tabernacle is carried, was carried out and the obedience of the people were, was displayed, Moses blessed them. If we take a look here in Exodus, Exodus chapter 39. See what it says here. Exodus chapter 39, verse 42 and 43. The Bible says, The Israelites had done all the work just as the Lord had commanded. Moses. Moses inspected the work and saw that they had done it just as the Lord had commanded. So Moses blessed them. See, when they had done all the work that God had commanded, Moses inspected it, blessed the people. And then in chapter 40, they set up the tabernacle, the dwelling place of God in the Old Testament. They set it up on the first day of the first month. And that was actually their one year anniversary of coming out of Egypt. What a year. <laughs> What a year that must have been for them. And what a year 2020 has been for us. Well, the Israelites set up the sanctuary and Moses finishes everything God has told him to do. And when the sanctuary is set up, the Lord actually comes in his glory. The glory of the Lord fills the tabernacle and God dwells among the people. And they're poised and positioned in the world to move forward under his leading. Well, family, you know, for us, as we prepare for 2021, let's recommit ourselves. Let's recommit ourselves to portraying the glory of God in our lives. We still have about 26 days to go. Are you with me here? 26 days to go until the end of the year. There's still time. If you're a guest watching today, there is plenty of time for you to get reconciled with the Lord and understand what it means to become a true baptized disciple of Jesus Christ. You see, if you have unrepentant sin in your life, make the most of this opportunity. The story of Exodus is truly the story of the gospel. As sinful people like us discovered the character of God and decided to live for the truth so that he could dwell with us. Well, that concludes our study of Exodus. We've traveled with Moses from the glory of God at the burning bush to the glory of God at the tabernacle. As we wrap up, there are some basic truths that we need to remember from this study. Number one, God's purpose for his people, for every baptized disciple, is freedom. He doesn't want us to be in bondage to ourselves or our sin or in the world. That's why he brought the Israelites out of Egypt. He wants us to be free, to do what's right. Number two, God's purpose and freedom is that 
His people show responsible conduct and service. You know, freedom isn't just, you know, doing whatever you want to do. No, you got to be responsible. You got to do what's right, right? It's the opportunity to do what God calls us to do. Number three, we grow in our maturity as we experience trials and tests, and we need to trust God to see us through. Complaining when life gets difficult is just a mark of spiritual immaturity. That's a big lesson to learn from the story of Exodus. Number four, God wants to dwell with us. That's amazing, right? Our sins can grieve his Holy Spirit, and he can withdraw his fellowship and blessing when we rebel. Thank God that we have a, a heavenly intercessor and advocate in Jesus Christ, and we can be united with him and be forgiven of our sins in the waters of baptism. Number five, disciples of Jesus are a kingdom of priests whose first responsibility is to worship and please God. Everything we are and everything we do depends on that, pleasing God. And as priests, right, we must minister to one another and to a lost world. Another one, the most important God, the most important goal in the Christian life is to be able to stand before the Lord one day and say sincerely, God, I have glorified you on the earth. I have finished the work you have given me to do. That was the heart of Jesus when he prayed right before the cross. I pray that will be our hearts too, that we can honestly say, Lord, Father, I deserve nothing, but I, I've tried to glorify you on earth. I've, I've completed the work you have given me to do. I've tried to make disciples as best as I can. I've tried to bear the fruits of the Spirit as best as I can. I deserve nothing. I am nothing. I know nothing. You are everything. And then God may just say to us, well done, well done, my good and faithful servant. Well, let's close here in 2 Corinthians chapter 2. 2 Corinthians chapter 2. In 2 Corinthians chapter 2, we'll pick it up here in verse 14. Again, the Apostle Paul speaking to the church in Corinth, they had a lot to learn. <laughs> but it says here in verse 14, but thanks be to God who always leads us, isn't that awesome, in triumphal procession in Christ and through us spreads everywhere the fragrance of the knowledge of him. For we are to God the aroma of Christ among those who are being saved and those who are perishing. To one we are the smell of death, to the other the fragrance of life. You know, that's why I like my last name, Andrew Smelly. Fragrance of life or the stench of death. <laughs> Who is equal to such a task? Unlike so many, we do not peddle the word of God for profit. On the contrary, in Christ we speak before God with sincerity, like men and women sent from God. Pretty awesome there. Let's pick it up in verse 3. You show that you are a letter from Christ, the result of our ministry. Written not with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but in tablets of human hearts. Such confidence as this is ours before Christ, before God, not that we are competent in ourselves to claim anything for ourselves, but our competence comes from God. He has made us competent as ministers of a new covenant, not of the letter, right? Not of the just the Ten Commandments alone, but of the Spirit. For the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. Now, if the ministry that brought death, which was engraved in letters on stone, came with glory so that the Israelites could not look steadily at the face of Moses because of its glory, fading though it was, will not the ministry of the Spirit be even more glorious? If the ministry that condemns men is glorious, how much more glorious is the ministry that brings righteousness? For what was glorious has no glory now in comparison with the surpassing and what was fading away came with glory. How much greater is the glory of that which lasts? Therefore, since we have such a hope, we are very bold. We are not like Moses, who would put a veil over his face to keep the Israelites from gazing at it while the radiance was fading away. But their minds were made dull. For it is this day the same veil remains when the old covenant is read. 
It has not been removed because only in Christ is it taken away. Even to this day, when Moses is read, a veil covers their hearts. We've got to pray for our friends, our Jewish friends who don't understand the new covenant, don't understand the relationship that God wants to have with us through Jesus Christ. Verse 16, but whenever anyone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now the Lord is spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is is freedom. And we, who with unveiled faces all reflect the Lord's glory, are being transformed into his likeness with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. Man, what a gift it is to be part of the new covenant, the new relationship of God. It's, it's because of Jesus that we can give God glory through the new covenant. Well, family, let's all continue to reflect the Lord's glory as we boldly bring as many friends as possible to celebrate our Bring Your Neighbor Day at our Christmas service in just two weeks. Despite the challenges of COVID, it has been an incredible year of glorifying the Lord. So encouraging to see all those who've been added to God's kingdom. Let's beg God to bring in the last of the harvest as we run through the finish line into 2021 and help as many as possible to be united with the Lord in the waters of baptism. Thank you so much for joining us today. And I pray this message encouraged you. May God bless you. 